Thank you, Eduardo, Miguel, and all of you, one and all, especially the high school students. Uh, could you raise your hands? They're high school students. Uh, every, ah, come on, let's. You know, there is nothing, there is nothing more fun than looking forward to 40 years of adventure in science. I can tell you because I'm at the other end of that. Um, it's, uh, it's a very exciting time, and I hope that uh, if you're interested in science, you participate to the fullest. Um, it's a grand adventure. The first time you see something that you think no one has saw before, has seen before, it's a real trip. It really is spectacular. So what I want to do today is um, tell you a little bit about the generation of form. And um, you know, I guess it all starts with a question that little kids ask their parents uh, all together too soon. Uh, and that is, where did I come from? That's about the time that mom says to dad, why don't you take a crack at it? <laughs> And mom and dad says to mom, no, you go first. Um, and once we get past this, uh, what then? So all of us started out as a fertilized egg. Let's see if this laser pointer works here. Can anyone see that? Hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's too bright. Um, I'm going to have to do some gyrations up here in the microphone. Is, is um, Okay. Um, so we'll do the best we can without a, a pointer. Um, so it's a round uh, embryo. It's a round fertilized egg, and it's going to make a person. And it's going to grow enormously. But where does the pattern come from? Um, there were a lot of ideas about this. And um, to answer this question, uh, where, where did we get, uh, how did we get from, from there to here, where we are now as adults? Um, how are we shaped? That's the big question. Now, the, the, back in the 1600s, 1700s, the people who believed in preformation tried to avoid the problem. Uh, they basically said that the form was preformed in the sperm or, or, or the egg, the spermus and the, and the ovus as an endless series of shells, one inside the other. And then in each generation, the outer shell grew up. Uh, and then the next one and the next one. There are obvious problems with this, but it's quite a humorous thing. If this was the era in which the microscope was first invented. And those microscopes were actually better than ours because a number of these ovus and spermus, one in particular, a spermus, uh, looked in the sperm of humans and he saw this little homunculus here and another uh, he said he could also look in the uh, horse sperm and see a little horse in there. And as well, you could see a little donkey in the donkey sperm, except the ears were bigger. And it gives credence to my uh, colleague out in Berkeley, uh, John Gerhardt, saying is, when I believe it, I will see it. Now, the real mechanism of uh, what actually has more success, had more success in popularity, is the idea of epigenesis. And that is that the development uh, of the embryo is from more com from uh, uh, it's a development of more complex form from simpler form, and what you have here you don't know whether, know whether you can see that little dot. Maybe I can actually see, uh, uh, get it on here now with this. Uh, well, it's still weak. Um, down here where that one is, that's a, a one-day human embryo, and it's about as big as a pencil point on a piece of paper. And it as it grows, and it grows enormously, as you can see. Uh, through the days, early days to day 23 down at the bottom right, what you wind up with is um, an enormous amount of growth uh, and an emergence of form. First, just simple form and then more complicated form. And this is a use of the term epigenesis to mean the evolution or unfolding of more complex structure from simple. Um, now, morphogenesis is basically that process, and it means form or shape, creation or generation. And it's a process by which the developing embryo changes shape. Now the 
example I'm going to use is frog egg, which you see here. It's about a millimeter and two tenths across. And the fertilized egg, shortly after fertilization, about 100 minutes, it divides every 30 minutes to make hundreds and then finally thousands of cells. And they move around, change shape, and grow. And they'll get up to around 15,000 cells at this point. And what's happening at this stage is down in the lower left side here, I can tell that's going to be the backbone side of the embryo because all the nuclei in these cells, these thousands of cells, are nominally identical. Um, and they've been parceled out into many, many cells. Now the big problem is how do you check out the genes in a differential fashion and read the, the, the genome out in the expression of proteins to make differences? And that process has already started here because this lower left side of the left diagram there is already different and that's going to be the backbone side. What I'm gonna do is turn this egg upside down and I'm gonna put that side at the top. And that dark area you see at the top right above that, that's going to form your spine. And when I hit this key, uh, the, the outer rind of the embryo will roll inside where you see the finer cells or dots on the sides. It will roll inside and make tissues on the inside. That's the mesoderm and the endoderm. And this, the material at the top that you see elongating, that's the nervous system. And it's gonna fold up into a tube and form the nervous system with the brain, the larger brain at the anterior end. Now that's the big question. How does it do that? That's 15,000 cells. Here it is larger. So you look at those little uh, granulations, those are the cells. Now what they can do, the big question is, how do they coordinate this and how do they generate the forces to do morphogenesis? So the problem is an integrated movement of a large population of cells. These cells are mechanically linked and coordinated. They are attached to each other to form groups, sheets, and columns, and clumps, and other forms. What you see on the outside is them all uh, glued together by junctions that are pretty much like the mortar uh, uh, or grout in your uh, tile floor in your bathroom. Um, and there are other way, ways that they connect. But these connections can change. They can have different affinities from one another. They can have preferences in who they stick to. And they can move relative to one another, exchange neighbors, and change shape, and crawl, just like we walk across the substratum, the floor, for example. This whole process here takes about 12 hours. From the start here until when that blastopore, that circle closes, um, is six hours, and another six hours in the completion of neurulation. During this period and before, they signal or talk to one another, and they use two methods. One is chemical signals or molecular signals that either pass from cell to cell or diffuse between them, and then there are receptors that receive these signals on the cells, and they respond by changing either their fate or what they do. And secondly, and this is something that we've discovered in the last 10, 15 years or documented, they've long, it's long been suspected, that mechanical signals of pushing and pulling also send information between the cells. Now this is, just for background, I wanna show you the basics of frog development here. And what I'm gonna do is play this movie again, and then I'm going to slice it and turn it a quarter to the right, to the left rather, and section it, and then you see the diagrams. And what you'll see is that green line there uh, that has the grape looking things, uh, grape bunch looking things at the top. The area above that's called the marginal zone and the inside of the embryo is colored red. That's the mesoderm and it will migrate, it will turn the corner or involute, that's just a technical term, you don't have to remember it. It's basically like turning inside out and those red cells will crawl up across into that space that you see to the right, uh, which is the blastocele. And there's a number of ways that they get where they're going that we'll talk about. And that continues to where the, the, um, the tissue around that green area there gets smaller and smaller. Those cells get moved in. But the, uh, when this movie starts again, see that all the material that rolls in, it also squeezes in something that we call convergence 
and extension, the convergence part being the squeezing around and the extension part being uh, the elongation of that red material after it gets in. That's the mesoderm, and it will form, and you see the tadpole down there, that long red line is a notochord, and then you've got somites on both sides. That forms the vertebral column. That's the important thing to remember. It's, it's just the same in, in your body, the vertebral column. And then the nervous system, as you can see, the dark blue, uh, gets longer and longer in those diagrams above, and you can see it getting it reaching its, in the movie, you can see it's reached its extreme about there, and then it closes up and drops down inside to form that long blue uh, line in the tadpole, which is from the hindbrain to the tail. So the endoderm is the stuff that is covered over in this movie to the left, and the yellow stuff in the diagrams there, and it winds up making the gut. Um, and so you've got three layers. You've left, the, we're left with just the, um, uh, epidermis on the outside, the skin, which you see there on the tail of the animal, the tadpole, and then the mesoderm forms the middle layer of the body and the endoderm, uh, the gut. Now let's take a look at this in more detail and ask the question, how do cells accomplish this? Um, we're going to go through three methods. One, they can change their shape, becoming wedge-shaped to form a depression, a pit, or a groove, much like that neural plate. And so, um, this movie is looping back and forth. You can see it's, there's a dark area up there where the cells are constricting. They're uh, making their apices, their outer surfaces, smaller, and it forms a groove. And you can see the green cells in that diagram there at the top. Uh, they look like um, little wedges. And that's, in fact, what they are, a deeper, uh, more high, a higher magnification from left to right in the, the, the box there. You can see that green area on the surface at the lower left. Um, those are all little cubical cells, and the outer surfaces contract to make these wedge-shaped. They were called bottle cells in the old days. And what's happening is, if you look at the edge from edgewise view of them, the red arrows indicate that that end of the cell contracted, and it's, it's, it forcibly contracts. And if you look at that in detail, what they do is they assemble a contractile machinery, and it's made out of the same things your muscles are, actin and myosin. But your muscles are permanently organized, and they use, if, if you use a, a bit different myosin and actin. What happens in cells is they constantly reorganize their muscles. They can build muscles in various places very quickly. And so what you see in the bottom in that diagram below the words actin and myosin, where the two big arrows are, you see blue actin filaments that show up there and myosin filaments, and myosin crawls on actin and it causes a contraction, the red arrows. And that makes the, the surface of the egg smaller. Look in this left diagram here at the bottom and you can see the red area there is much smaller than the arrows were up above. So that would bend the sheet, but only if those cells are connected. And this is an important part about this whole scheme, and that is mechanical linkage. So we got a behavior, the contraction is co coordinated to be only in certain areas, and it's induced by high levels of something called nodal. Um, you don't have to remember that. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 to use the contraction to bend a sheet, they have to be connected, and those little green entities that connect the boxes down at the lower right there are cadherins. They're molecules that stick the cells to one another. Now the second thing that can be accomplished that, that these cells do to accomplish this global um, uh, 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 morphology, they can crawl or migrate as individuals, much like you would walk across a floor. Um, and they can do that as individuals or as coordinated, group, coordinated groups. And this is all, all often called collective or integrated migration of cells. And if you look at the whole process of closing on the outside and then look at those diagrams again, as that tongue of cells turns up, if you look at the red in the first diagram, you can see that tongue-like thing going up, and then it, it crawls across the roof, which is light blue. They're actually crawling as a group. And finally, they wind up way at the left under the light blue down there, and that's the head, that's the future head, the brain, which you see closing up at the top right of that uh, diagram, that the movie. So how do, how do they do that? 
Well, if you look at this at, at, as a, as a, in three dimensions, it's like turning a, a, a can inside out, an annulus inside out. And it's a big sheet that actually sweeps across the embryo. And if we put the best rest of the embryo back there, you can see the context of this big sheet of mesoderm. It looks much like a highlight racket. Now, if we look at those boxes that just appeared up above there, as those cells migrate, this is what they're doing. And what you see in this movie that glows is actin. And cells can do various things with actin. And you can uh, see this in the diagram. They can make the two right uh, uh, arrays a gel-like network, which is in these lamellipodia. We call these things lamellipodia because they're flat feet, lamellipodia. Um, and they can also make phylopodia, long skinny projections. And they extend their boundary toward the upper right, which is toward the head. And they grab and then they build stress fibers, which you can't see well here. I can see them, but you probably can't. Um, um, and those stress fibers then contract and pull the tail up. Now, um, this is directed, this migration is directional. It heads toward the brain region, it, so these cells wind up under the brain. And here we, we have an example of a directional, a, a guidance of a directional uh, migration. And you see the red arrow in the far right there in the blue area? That blue area is future brain or uh, uh, nervous system. And that arrow represents a signal that happened earlier over to the right here of a molecule that's called fibroblast growth factor. You don't have to remember it, but it's one of these growth factors, or what we call cytokines or growth factors. Um, they're sometimes involved in growth, but they give messages to cells. And so that um, FGF, it's called, uh, abbreviated, um, uh, is secreted by those, uh, uh, or by the marginal zone, the, 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 where the origin of the arrow is to the right, and somehow it passes up through this sheet, and it tells the blue cells to make a signaling molecule, another molecule uh, called, called platelet-derived growth factor. You don't need to know the name. It's just another molecule that somehow it sticks to that network of matrix there. And so there's another component, and that is that there's matrix and there's secreted matrix that's sort of like a rag or a tissue of, of fibrils. And in some cases, these signaling molecules stick to it. And in this case, that is very important because if it doesn't stick to that matrix, it doesn't work. So the little green dots actually may be bound in a gradient as well because the messages that make that um, the protein, um, the green one, uh, is graded from the lower left to the upper right. And that could be a, a cue uh, the cells may be following um, uh, along on where the signal, toward where the signal is strongest. Now, the cells themselves have receptors, and receptors are little molecules in the plasma membrane that sense the extracellular signals, and then they change conformation and signal into the cytoplasm, and there's a cascade of things happen uh, that changes the behavior. And so you've got a directional signal, and it directs cells to make a pathway coated with a second chemical signal, this uh, platelet-derived growth factor, possibly in a gradient, and that's read by the migrating cells using their receptor for that molecule, their sensor, their taster for that. And that activates processes inside to polarize the movement toward the head. And if you take away th components of this or remove the, uh, 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 the, uh, the stickiness of the matrix or the capacity of the molecule, the, signaling, the green signaling molecule to stick to the matrix, the migration will not work. So this is a combination of signals, spatial and temporal signals, that uh, pattern or guide this migration. But that's not the only component. The other component requires something called mechanical integration or mechanotransduction, and this is relatively new. This is a new thing that we've discovered in morphogenesis. If you look in greater detail at that region where those cells are crawling, what you will see between these cells, they're going to the upper right, and if you can see at the back ends of those orange cells there where they're contacting one another, there's a yellow dot. And those are cadherins again, these sticky molecules, these sticky molecules 
that connect the cells. Now, my colleagues at, um, at Virginia, Doug D. Simone and Greg Weber and uh, Marine um, uh, um, um, uh, temporarily forgotten her name, sorry, um, uh, did uh, 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 Birke. Um, she, they did an experiment, a fascinating experiment. They were wondering um, whether that sticky uh, stuff behind their connections at the rear end of these cells was aiding in that migration because if you separate these cells into individuals, that single cell over to the right there, it's, tri it's multipolar. If you isolate these cells, they'll go in all directions and they're not polarized in one direction like the ones are at the top left of that box B. Um, but so what they did was they wanted to test whether pulling on this cell would, would uh, guide it. So they took those individual cells and they stuck a magnetic bead to it, which you see down at the lower left, the green thing stuck to the cell. And then they used a magnet. This, this bead is, a, is actually a magnet as well. And then they put a magnetic pole there and they pulled on the little bead. What you see in the movie is, look at the sign, magnet on, magnet off. Every time they turn the magnet on, the little cell takes off in the direction opposite of where the magnet is to the right. So magnet's off, magnet on, it takes off. Magnet off, it loses its way again. Magnet on, it's going to take off again. So the bottom line is they were able to test the hypothesis that as the first cell moves forward, it feels a tugging from behind because of its attachment to its neighbors behind, and that stimulates it to move stronger in that direction. And if you knock out any of those components that are involved in this, um, the migration of individual cells doesn't work and the, the group is compromised as well. So what happens is at the bottom there in the green, you get a tugging which recruits some other molecules. It's called placoglobin, and it, it attaches the uh, the cadherins, the adhesion molecules, the green things, uh, to a cytoskeleton of keratin filaments, which then somehow signal to other parts of the cell to go forward. So this is what we call a force transduced signaling cascade to get a directional migration up to the upper uh, right. Now the final thing that I'm going to talk about is the big one at least in my book, because it's the one, we used to call it the main engine of gastrulation, because it's, it's the single, if you block this particular machine, it has the single most devastating effect of anything you can do. I speak from experience. <laughs> so what you see down here is the same movie that we've been playing with the whole time. 